Thank you, everyone, for coming. Really do appreciate it. So, yeah, thank you, uh, Chris. Happy to be here, and thanks for everybody on this call. I know you had uh, different uh, options for this morning or afternoon, wherever you are uh, based. So I'm ha really happy that you decided to uh, do this kind of uh, excellent decision. Uh, regarding the first question, no, we don't have three slides. We have uh, more than three slides. And I'm happy also to hear questions from, from your side, not only presenting, but also answering uh, questions about where are we going uh, in Imperva data security? Okay, so this is a new roadmap for database security after the acquisition. Uh, it changed the roadmap, of course, positively. And you're going to see how, how you're going to leverage, you know, eventually a, a unified solution of what, uh, what used to be in the past Imperva database security plus JSON. -R. Okay, first of all, you know, I need to so show you the disclaimer slide, safe harbor. What you're going to see is a roadmap stuff that uh, we are working on. And, uh, you know, as, as any kind of a roadmap presentation or, or delivery, things may change because many customers eventually come, come to us and ask for so many things to, uh, to work on. Okay. Um, let's start with uh, what uh, was done uh, early in uh, 2020. For those of you who haven't read the release notes and the updates, so early in 2020, in, in first quarter, we managed to update the virtual appliances and the hardware appliance. Uh, there is a new, new data sheet that will be published soon uh, with all the configuration that is required for each one of the uh, both virtual appliances and hardware appliances. Okay. Um, so if there are some questions, I'll, um, I'll be more than happy to answer about it. In addition, uh, early in 2020, we also added uh, some enhancements to the agents and, um, and assessments. We added the MongoDB assessments and some new, uh, certified some new databases. Later in 2020, we added a significant more uh, content uh, to database security, including also what is going to be released actually next week, uh, version 14.3 for uh, uh, database activity monitoring secure sphere. Um, so uh, lots of uh, databases and versions that we are certifying. And now everything is exposed from a coverage tool. Feel free to send me an email or a, a message if you're not familiar with the coverage tool. We are gradually adding more and more databases and operating system that we certify every month. Every month, sorry, we update, uh, we provide another kind of uh, agent release that certify additional uh, operating systems and uh, databases, database versions. So you can see some of the versions that we are releasing very soon, certifying the Cloudera data platform 7.1 and 7.2 and MongoDB 4.4. I'm not going to go over all of those new versions, so feel free to uh, review um, um, more often the uh, coverage tool, okay? We, we, we uh, also um, focus more and more on uh, releasing uh, new um, assessments for uh, the new CIS and DISA benchmarks, this time for Oracle and Microsoft SQL, we also added uh, entitlement reports based on custom assessments for DB2 on mainframe and MySQL. And now we are going to release also assessments for uh, the databases, uh, the cloud databases. Uh, regarding the product, um, major improvements on the gateway. Now you will be able to use uh, less gateways in order to um, support more agents, by the way. We managed to add the transaction per seconds of the gateway to uh, by 20%, which is a lot. So in the future, if you expand the solution, you will need less gateways. Uh, in addition, now uh, DAM is also available uh, for a deployment on Google Cloud Platform. So if you are planning to lift and shift your databases and, and uh, also audit uh, cloud databases, now it's also available from uh, Google Cloud Platform. 
We also added a support for Azure clustering. Okay, and probably one of the major in investment in uh, 2020 was around the user space agent. So from your side, eventually you'll be, you'll see less and less request or need to update the agent every time you patch your li uh, Linux operating system. Okay, so we, what we did is like, do we decouple the um, agent runtime from the kernel? And now it is um, more agnostic to, um, to uh, patches and changes in the operating system, okay? Gradually, we will support all the databases and, and, uh, and move all the um, uh, agent packages to the user space. We started with Oracle and MySQL and Postgre, and, and then we, we moved to all other databases that uh, we support today. Okay, so let's talk about the future, okay? So with the acquisition of JSONer, we are actually announcing uh, a DB Security 2.0, okay? Means that uh, from our side, of course, we are going to be the largest organization that focus on data security and protecting data in customers' um, um, repositories, could be databases or, or data lakes, okay? And, um, and provide some unique capabilities that can help you uh, to do more with less eventually. Okay, so with JSONer, let me uh, give you some overview on JSONer. What is it, JSONer? So uh, we heard from you for so many years about, you know, lots of transformations of technologies like moving to data lakes, moving to cloud databases, modernizing your data warehouse to database, data warehouse like Snowflake, for example, or BigQuery or Redshift, okay? So we've seen huge amount of transformations from traditional technologies, uh, either to cloud or to data lakes. And um, with JSONa, we believe that um, we are going to cover all of those gaps. JSONa already provide uh, more than 60 out of the box connectors to each one of those cloud or long tail databases. You know, name a, a specific database try to challenge us if we support it or not. And if we don't support it, we can immediately, um, uh, if you want to expand your solution, we can support this kind of database in less than a month, okay? So please feel free to challenge us on each one of those databases that you ever ask from us to support, or you have seen that your application developers are transforming the technology. Do not hesitate, contact us. And it could be that we already support the database, we can provide audit and risk analytics, or if it doesn't, if it's not supported, and you can see also in the coverage tool, um, then uh, we we can uh, immediately provide the support in in less than a month. Another thing that uh, many of our customers uh, struggled is with reporting, um, in, including uh, be able to prepare for audit reviews. So in order to prepare for audit reviews, you need to provide a specific view or uh, run a, a, some slice and dice and uh, maybe export the data to different systems, okay? So now all of those uh, challenges gone. With J JSONar, you get really a single pane of glass of all of your audit data uh, that is being stored for years. Okay, so you can uh, run any kind of uh, audit uh, review for any kind of data from one place. No need to um, consolidate uh, data from uh, many files or uh, export the data to another system. <clears throat> In addition, uh, one of the challenges that we've seen is the need to uh, retain data for up to seven years. So from one side, you need to retain the data for up to seven years. Although I heard many customers that need to retain the data for maybe one year, but in, in some cases it could be huge amount of data, like, um, like um, petabytes of data that need to be prepared for an audit review or, for, uh, or in order to reduce the attack surface, okay? So uh, with Sonar, you have a very, very efficient 
uh, from, uh, from total cost of ownership perspective, a solution that can compress the data in a very efficient way from one side, store the, um, the archive data on a low cost uh, storage, uh, while from the other side, you can use this data for uh, audit reviews. Okay, so data retention is, is uh, something that uh, uh, could be a key for, for the audit reviews. Another thing that I would recommend looking at is the, um, uh, are all of those uh, playbooks that uh, provided from JSONR. You get something like 2000 integrations to different tools uh, that can be used for remediation, okay? Um, so um, what, um, what you can do is run those kind of playbooks and um, use them for, um, for fast mitigation and uh, automate some activities, okay? And uh, one of the things that we hear from also many customers is that uh, they spend a lot, a lot on Splunk and there is a need to reduce the TCO. Okay, so before you just uh, send all the audit events and the alerts to Splunk, you can store it and run some analytics uh, in JSONR and then decide, you know, what kind of, uh, um, what kind of uh, audit events or alerts um, can be uh, sent to Splunk. Sorry about it. Uh, let me jump to uh, the slide. Okay. Okay, so, so in general, that was like an overview on what is JSON. I hope you get it. It's, a, it's an amazing platform um, that is a complementary platform for um, what we have today, what we used to have uh, so far. In general, you know, as a product manager, I already, you know, defined a roadmap um, that includes some of those capabilities. Okay, already we started working on a large scale audit reporting and DB connect to uh, um, integrate to any kind of uh, cloud and long tail database that you have and, and workflows and so on. All of those capabilities were in our roadmap. But now once we uh, acquire JSONR, we can eventually um, accelerate uh, the roadmap and jump directly to 2023 and start working and providing, uh, and start delivering applications that we only dreamed on, like data privacy, for example. Okay, so that, that's the outcome of the JSON acquisition, a complementary platform that uh, provide additional value that uh, couldn't be achieved in the past. So what, how does the strategy looks like for 2021? First of all, our main goal is to create a single management. Okay, so now you have the MX that is managing all the agents and the gateways and there is audit management. Okay, um, and then there is JSONR that manage all the uh, cloud and long tail databases. So eventually our goal is to create a single management that will manage all of those assets from a central place. Okay, both the agents and the agentless. Uh, solutions. Um, in addition, we have a goal to support um, lots of uh, technological transformation programs to the cloud or to data lakes or to modernize databases like Snowflake and BigQuery and so on. Uh, we are expanding into data privacy market. Uh, we, we, are, we believe that we have a unique solution in the data privacy market that is both integrating the audit capabilities that we have, the risk analytics that we have with uh, workflows of uh, data privacy to support uh, GDPR and CCPA needs. Um, in addition, we also um, invest a lot in order to increase the cadence. So once you certify, once you need to certify a new database version or an operating system 
we can respond sooner, okay? Um, and uh, provide more capabilities to boost the onboarding process of the deployment, of the um, scalability of uh, database security. That's our main goal for 2021. So those kind of uh, five objectives are going to lead our product strategy for both uh, DAM, uh, JSONR, and for some extent also data risk analytics, okay? So how does the DAM management in the future will look like, okay? In general, our goal, as I mentioned, is to move to a single pane of glass. What does it mean? It means that a year from now, we are going to release a new version of database security in which you'll have one console that will manage both the agents and the agentless that came from JSONR. Okay, um, so if you have like uh, either databases on the cloud or uh, various databases that aren't supported today, you'll be able to manage them from, from the MX, from one single, one large scale MX. Okay, and what does it mean by large scale MX? It means that we are going to gradually remove the reporting from the MX as I mentioned, JSON are already come with uh, amazing reporting and analytics capabilities with data retention. So no need to use the MX anymore as your reporting platform. In JSON, you also have uh, embedded uh, database and analytics, and you can customize your own views, report, slice and dice easily. Okay, uh, so we prefer gradually to remove those reports and um, have a separate DAS server to run all the scans, all the classification scans, assessments, user right management, and so on. And then eventually what is left in the MX is only the need to manage the agents, the agentless, the gateway clusters, and also the audit. Okay? And we believe that with one MX, um, you can manage the entire environment. Of course, uh, at the end, we will publish uh, sizing recommendations uh, of how this kind of environment should look like and also provide some scripts and capabilities that can help, uh, help uh, you, you know, engage with our professional services or do it by yourselves um, to move to this kind of new architecture. So that's what, th this is how the management, the future management is going to look like which is going to be unified with JSONAR. Sonar Gateway is actually the, the, the component that eventually collect a native audit from using a log collection or other techniques from uh, cloud databases and uh, other databases. And the gateway is what we have today. Okay, so let's talk about the future of dumb reporting. Okay, we are talking about loud reporting event, leveraging sonar to become the single pane of glass from reporting and analytics for us a year from now. Actually, it's going to be available even in um, like in next quarter, okay? But uh, without all the reporting, okay? What we are going to have in Q1 is integrated audit reporting because this is, you know, a challenge that many of our Kobe, you okay? Everything? Yeah. Um, sorry. Something happened to Zoom? Maybe so. Okay. That was kind of weird. Sorry about yeah. that, everyone. Yeah. Live, uh, live webinars sometimes, it just happens. Okay. 
Okay, so um, I, I started talking about the vulnerability assessment 360, which is like a unification of uh, lots of vulnerability assessments that are collected by Jay Sonar, not only from Imperva, um, from the MX, from all the assessments and the custom assessment that you that you already have in the MX that are running, but also from other system, could be like Tenable, Qualis, and so on, other uh, tools that. Uh, manage uh, vulnerabilities in your environment, okay? Um, DB Security 360 uh, is also going to collect, uh, to provide you eventually a single risk score for all of your databases and data lakes. So you can easily prioritize the investment. What does it mean? It means that we will collect um, all the various findings and alerts and incidents from data risk analytics, uh, the security alerts from them, assessments, user right management, classification scan results. Okay, and then what we will do is provide like a risk score based on the sensitivity of the database. And then for each one of the database, not only you see the sensitivity level and you'll see also the different things that we recommend to do. Like, hey, there is like a vulnerability that you need to patch and then you can activate a playbook from this kind of dashboard. And, uh, and then there is like an, um, a specific incident from data risk analytics on the same database. And, and what we will do, we will accumulate all of those findings and incidents and alerts and tell you, hey, you know what? Here is like this kind of Oracle instance need to be handled before the others because it has more sensitive data than others. And there are some vulnerabilities and alerts on it. That's the idea with the DB Security 360 to help you to prioritize the investment instead of uh, trying to focus on so many products. So eventually, um, and you'll see some of it also already released in Q1, we are going to have, uh, we are going to move to a different type of architecture, an evolution of what we have today, okay? And leveraging JSONR as the um, reporting platform and the MX as the management platform, okay? Um, the gateways will stream all the audit events directly to JSONR, okay? Uh, all the audit events and the alerts to JSONR, all the assessment, all the scan results from the MX will be sent to JSONR as well, okay? And then also data risk analytics later on, it, towards the end of 2021, we'll also collect all the um, audit events from JSONR in real time um, without a 24 hours delay, and also store all the incidents back to JSONR. Okay, so that's going to be the architecture. By the way, what does it mean for the uh, agent-based gateway? It means that it's going to be um, um, more, even more lightweight, okay? Uh, we are going to even more uh, uh, improve the efficiency of the agent of the gateway and support up to 30K TPS for each one of the gateways. And the reason is that because the gateway is not going to include audit archives, all the audit events will be streamed directly to JSON. Okay. Um, another kind of capability that we are working on, as you can see from the bottom part, is um, if you already have uh, old audit archives that stored somewhere like in a NAS or S3, uh, we will provide a capability that will be uh, packaged with JSONR to load all of those historical audit archives to the database. So they will be able you, you'll be able also to use them for audit reviews up to seven years with the data retention capabilities of JSON. Okay. Okay. Um, another thing that I mentioned is all of those capabilities to of uh, fast mitigation um, leveraging the 2000 integrations and playbooks that are available in, in Sonar. So what we want to do is to start integrating all of those alerts 
assessment scan results, classification scan results, entitlement scan results, and then also incidents and issues from data risk analytics to certain workflows. Okay, so for some of the for some of those alerts and incidents, there will be dedicated playbooks that we will provide out of the box. But uh, the beauty of this kind of platform is that you will be able to create your own playbook, like customize it, write your own script, and uh, and uh, so it can be um, adapt to your uh, workflow. Some examples is like a quarantine IP or user, um, close the port, you know, if the port, for example, in the cloud is exposed externally. Delete excessive permissions based on a user right management scan, for example, um, or recommend to delete them and send in a ticket to um, someone that uh, responsible for the, for the permissions. Okay, one of the things that we uh, started to realize is that we need uh, um, to improve the um, coverage and protect better uh, data lakes. Um, many of our customers, as I mentioned, move to uh, transform the technologies. And uh, we've seen lots of programs on, uh, on cloud transformation and moving to data lakes and, and modernized data warehouse. And um, we would like to provide better protection and audit capabilities for those environments. So, so the audit activities, most of them, the good news is that uh, they are already audited and uh, we can collect the native audit using JSON of most of those environments, by the way. And, um, but what we are still missing are all of those um, assessments that we want to run um, and scan different type of misconfigurations based on CIS and DISA for, um, for various uh, cloud databases and, and data lakes. Okay, so first of all, we want to provide at least, you know, recommendations to reduce the attack surface. But then from the other side, we would like to also integrate it to those uh, playbooks and for some of them run some remediation. Okay, um, we would like also to discover sensitive data in S3 or in your Hadoop that is delivered as uh, AWS EMR or Azure HD Insight or Cloudera data platform on the cloud, or maybe you have data, sensitive data in your Azure blobs or S3 buckets. So we would like to um, deliver you know, a scanner that will be able to uh, discover sensitive data in each one of those uh, um, technologies. Okay, in addition also data risk analytics is going to leverage all of the um, um, JSON integrations to um, data lakes and cloud databases and uh, collect all the audit events directly to data risk analytics engines so um, we will be able to detect some suspicious activities in those environments as well. Last are the improvements around classification. We are currently working on modernized uh, classification engine um, that um, will help us to, as I mentioned, with the DB Security 360 to um, map the risk based on uh, the detection of sensitive data, could be PII, could be uh, um, other type of sensitive data. Um, detect sensitive data on the fly. Many of the applications are, are being released uh, on weekly basis, more often to the cloud. Um, so it could be that uh, new tables uh, and new columns with sensitive data deployed by the development teams. And um, if you don't catch it um, on the fly, then you may miss um, some personal identification that is being stored in a certain table. And, um, and, and this could be like um, a risk from your perspective. A coverage, uh, more scanners for more environment like Hadoop data lakes, um, um, 
and uh, cloud data warehouse. And um, of course, better user interface and also to improve the accuracy of the uh, classification. Um, what the beauty of it is that it's going to be a platform that will serve both uh, database security and data privacy. Okay. Data privacy in terms of uh, be able to um, detect more PIIs and understand whether they can track back to a certain data subject that may request, you know, to be forgotten or may request for data portability and so on. Or for database security, just to understand where sensitive data is being stored and uh, be able to audit it. Okay. All right, so a little bit summary on, um, on database security. Um, just to make sure that we understand, you know, where, when actually all of those capabilities are going to be delivered uh, in which quarter. So I split all of those nice capabilities to different kind of uh, themes, four themes actually, database coverage, be able to reduce the TCO and simplify the deployment, uh, have a you know fast onboarding, uh, reporting and workflows, and unified dam solution, which is a very important uh, uh, program that can eventually provide you a single pane of glass to manage all the environment. Okay. Um, there are also many other things, you know, we also uh, resolve lots of uh, feature requests. Um, if, the, if you have some feature requests that uh, you believe aren't handled, um, um, you can access the user voice. Uh, we, the user voice is a, is a great uh, platform for collaborating and voting on, on features. I really recommend each one of you to access user voice. And if you don't know, how to access, please contact our support or your, or your account manager or just open a ticket and ask to understand how you access a user voice. You can vote on features, you can search for some features that you already need, but apparently, you know, many other customers also ask for, so you can vote on it. And then this is eventually how I prioritize the product um, roadmap based on how you vote and, and the and the demand on specific features. Okay. And that's something that I, Toby, I can put into the uh, follow-up is the user voice link as well. Yeah, this is a very important environment. It, it allows us eventually in Imperva to understand what you guys need eventually and how to improve the product. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, so next is data privacy. I'm not going to present the entire roadmap for data privacy. Okay, it's a new product that we are currently working on. It will be released later in 2021. We will release the first version in Q1. And then gradually we will release more and more capabilities in data privacy. So just to explain what is data privacy and what are the challenges? And I don't know if you already struggled with those challenges, um, but uh, we've seen some of our customers and uh, more and more demand for those uh, due to um, some regulations like GDPR that was introduced few, several years ago and also um, uh, CCPA, okay? Um, so eventually the, the main challenge uh, with um, adhering to those regulations is to understand all of those kind of key questions that the data protection officer in your company struggle with, okay? Like, whose data do we hold? How can we find the data today? How are we protecting the data? Uh, and we are talking about PII. We are not talking about all data in the world, we are talking about data that relates, by the way, to each one of us. Like, um, could be, you know, if you are an employee, 
in your organization or if you are a user, okay, for a specific uh, bank or airline or insurance company, they stored your sensitive data. Many of those companies um, uh, store sensitive data about you, could be your kids, you know, uh, citizenship ID or social security number or shoe size or hobbies or gender or um, political opinion. All of those things uh, considered as sensitive data and something that you, you probably want to keep it to yourself and you may want to know like, who has access to what, and uh, because you want to control eventually what um, what all of, all of those end users can do with your data. Okay. Um, so each one of the organizations that adhere to GDPR and CCPA needs eventually to explain what they collect on you, um, and um, why are we holding the data. So from one side, you could be. Um, users that supposed to answer all of those questions to different data subjects. But from the other side, think about you as, uh, as users that your data is stored in, in various places. Okay. So what is the main challenge with uh, adhering to all of those regulations? Um, the main challenge is that um, uh, especially with GDPR and CCPA and uh, LGD, LGPD that was introduced in Latin America, is that um, each one of the end users of a certain company can wake up one day in the morning and can start to send some requests to you. So either your insurance company or airline company, and uh, you probably adhere to um, GDPR, if you have end users in the European community, or if you have users in California, or in Canada, or in Australia, there is a new one called APP, which is similar to GDPR, or if you have uh, end users in Singapore. And by the way, those are only examples of regulation, data privacy regulations, that rise like mushrooms in the forest, okay? And the list goes on. Each one of the states in the, in the US work on or, or, or think about introducing a similar regulation like CCPA. What it means for you as uh, uh, end users that's responsible for the data and the data, sensitive data in the organization and needs to adhere to regulations like GDPR and CCPA is that you need to automate all of those processes because if 1 million people wake up in the morning and start to ask for some requests could be like right to be forgotten, uh, right for access, like show me what kind of information is stored for me, or right for data portability, you know what? Like, hey, I would like to contact my healthcare company. Um, so they prepare a report for me with all the sensitive data, health data on me, uh, because I would like to do something with it, like share it with an insurance company, for example. Okay, um, there could be a huge amount of example why data portability is a huge challenge for many of the companies. Um, so think about, you know, you as end users, could be any kind of company in the world, receive like 1000 requests in a day to prepare some reports for specific end users. Could be bank end users, insurance company end users and so on. Okay, this is why it is more and more critical to automate all of those processes. So how does the process looks like? Okay, there is a specific workflow for data privacy and it is, it is different than database security, I can tell you. It can leverage database security for some extent and leverage some of the investment that you already did, but it requires more focus on correlating the PII, which is the key in, a, in each one of the data privacy solution. So what you need to do, what needs to be done all the time is to be able to correlate PII. What does it mean? It means that, let's say that Kobe, you know, like my social security number and gender is stored on MongoDB, 
And there is other kind of information, like my hobbies stored on S3 buckets, okay? There needs to be like a, a brain that will be able to correlate it in real time, all the time, continuously, detect some new tables and new columns with sensitive data, not only sensitive data, but PII data, figure out that, you know, this kind of data needs to be correlated to the data in MongoDB because when Kobe asks for a specific request like data to be forgotten, okay, um, I need to be able to show Kobe like one picture, okay? I don't care as an end user that, you know, some of the, my PII is stored in MongoDB and others in some certain S3 buckets. I don't care. All I want to understand is like what kind of information PII data is stored by this company on me. Okay. So the ability to, 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 to support requests is critical. Uh, adhering to SLA per GDPR and CCPA, there is like a 30 day SLA for replying to each one of those requests. And accuracy is critical be able to accurately provide back all the PII that is being stored. And of course, there is an audit by an auditor that uh, review all of those processes and the accuracy of the uh, PII information that is stored for each one of the data subjects. Um, another very important uh, angle for data privacy is the, to be able to protect sensitive data, uh, which here is like um, come the investment that you did on database activity monitoring or data risk analytics or user right management. If you already invested in those areas, then it will help you to um, build a, a better, a better solution, more efficient solution and, uh, and uh, for, for a data privacy. And the reason is that whenever data sensitive is discovered, the next thing that you want to do is to audit it. And the second thing that you want to do is to understand who is, what are the user rights for this kind of PII data? Like who are the users or maybe the applications that can access this uh, sensitive data? Um, okay. And of course, uh, be able to handle uh, uh, alerts, breach, and, uh, and, and, and manage all of those uh, security risks with playbooks, okay? So what, what you should do next um, is try to understand if this could be relevant for you. You probably have uh, someone in your company that is called a data protection officer. Um, if your organization adhere to GDPR or CCPA, per those kind of regulation, there needs to be someone that is called DPO. It could be that they have different title. It could be that they report to legal department or maybe a VP of uh, data governance or VP of compliance and so on. They could have different title, but eventually they, you know, whenever the, an auditor comes in, and start to audit on GDPR. The first thing they ask, you know, after, you know, like where is the uh, coffee machine is like, who is the DPO in this company? Okay. So, uh, so DPO is someone that uh, responsible eventually for all of those uh, processes, requests and, and making sure that there are no, not going to be penalties. And penalties is, is something that you need to be aware of if you aren't able to, uh, to respond for a, for a GDPR or CCPA request on time, like in, in 30 days, you get penalties. And if you are interested, by the way, search in Google for GDPR penalties or CCPA penalties. I assume there are more penalties on GDPR because it's like started a few years earlier. Um, you'll be surprised to see very famous companies that had to pay like $20 million penalties on GDPR, $30 million on GDPR and so on. Okay. So this kind of uh, challenge, so this is the main challenge for 
this guy that is uh, that is the data protection officer. Um, so there are the capabilities of a data privacy solution um, are be able to uh, all the time be able to track continuously for PIIs. Capacity management is very, very important capability for data privacy. You know, from one side, you need to understand how many requests per day I have, like data subject access requests from specific end users. How many PII I have, okay? It's like how much it takes time to search for, for PIIs, correlate PIIs and so on. And eventually how many data owners I have that can actually manage the entire solution. Okay, because if I don't have enough data owners, um, then that could be a challenge. You may you may have you may face more and more penalties. Most of the GDPR requests can't be handled automatically, unfortunately. Like right to be forgotten, right to be forgotten is something that you will have to do manually in most cases, due to a conflict between different regulations. Okay, in some cases you need to store to retain data for seven years. But from the other side, a guy like myself, for example, come in the morning and ask for a right to be forgotten. So someone will have to figure out that there is a conflict between the, the regulations and reject this kind of request. Okay, so many of those requests um, uh, can't be done, can't be um, processed automatically, but manually. <clears throat> So this is a, a good example of a workflow that uh, already, Gardner already did the workflow for you. So if you want to understand how a data privacy workflow should look like, so it, it should look like this is the best practice, okay? Um, most of it will be covered by the way, by Imperva, but some of it will have to be handled um, from customer support or from, um, or from the IT help desk, okay? The reason those two kind of portals will have to be handled is because, you know, think about the two main data subjects that may start a request. Those could be external end users and usually external end users um, access your customer support page portal and then send a request for something. And one of the requests could be like, uh, subject right request, like right to be forgotten or data portability and so on. Okay, but per GDPR also internal employees can also open a ticket, usually from the IT help desk and like ServiceNow for example, and ask for the same kind of request. Okay, so each one of you as a, an employee can also uh, submit a request uh, for GDPR. Okay, um, what we are planning to do in, in the future, by the way, like we are considering to uh, de uh, deliver application uh, from the ServiceNow marketplace that will be able to handle this request, send it to Imperva for, to search for a specific PII and then return back rep uh, with the, the, re the report. Okay. Toby, we do have lots of questions in the chat, so I don't know how, how many more slides we have, but I'll try to get some of those. Yeah, I think that what we can do, we can start to summarize. Eventually, we can schedule a follow-up meeting on your data privacy. Okay. I, potentially, I can, uh, you know, um, but, um, but uh, there is a roadmap uh, for data privacy. Uh, we are in a stage that we are currently recruiting better customers. Uh, design partners, so if you want to review, provide feedback, test the product, um, and also, you know, understand how the product can be relevant for your processes, your needs, we will be more than happy to work with you. So that could be like a win-win situation. You will be able to learn from us on data privacy and how to um, um, build all of those processes that I described. And from the other side, we will be able to understand how the product can technically deploy it in your environment or who are the personas that eventually can uh, leverage the, the pages that we are working on. Okay. Great. So 
Yeah. If great. Have, so, so, Kobe, thanks for that. Lots of great content. Um, again, this will be recorded. I'm going to start um, asking you these questions, Kobe, and we'll get through. Uh, we'll probably stay another five or 10 minutes after. So if you want to stay, you can. If not, it will be recorded. So first question, Kobe, my favorite. Will the T TMAX database support it? So it's kind of the first of the presentation. Sorry, which one of them? Will the TMAX database support it? This is from CJ. TMAX? Yeah, TMAX. CJ, I don't know if you're still on, but maybe you could put yeah. a little context on what that. I, what I recommend to do? Hi, uh, is, you can hear me? Yes. Uh, it, it cycle. Last year, uh, we have a big customer use this database. We asking about this kind of database. They say they will support at Q1 or Q2 at next year is 2021. But I didn't see it at the slide, so just asking. Thank you. Can you? Okay, so if you can send the name of the database. Um, that will be great because I'm not sure that I got it. Eventually, what I can do here is also share the link to the coverage tool. Uh, again, what you should do, you should access this coverage tool that is exposed uh, publicly to everybody. And if the database or its version doesn't appear here, what you need to do is, of course, go to user voice and uh, let us know about this database or open a ticket and um, and um, we, we will uh, contact you and understand what does it mean to support it. Um, and if it's so critical, we will be able to uh, offer it with JSON. Great. So we did, I, I, I don't know if you put something in the, the chat, Kobe, but uh, if not, put that in there. But uh, next question from Jamie, is any assessment improvements or changes on the roadmap for SAP HANA? It says, I see, I see new uh, Mongo options. Yes, yeah, Sapana, we are certifying 2.4 and 2.5, uh, supporting Sapana on Power Platform also, so the agent can run on Power Platform. And also JSON also supports Sapana very soon. Um, so if you, don't, if you prepare, prefer to use uh, our native audit capabilities with a log collection and not deploy an agent, that's also a possibility. Great, thank you. Um, so another question, is Oracle 19C RDS going to be covered soon for DAMGW Gateway? So yeah, this is, uh, this, this is also, well, I would recommend to uh, uh, leverage JSONR. It has uh, very powerful capabilities to support cloud databases. Um, and okay. um, and gradually is that a no? <laughs> yeah, I mean uh, um, we will invest more and more on cloud databases with JSON in the future. Okay, so right now it doesn't cover it, but uh, we that is something that we're looking at. Is that is that a correct statement, Kobe? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so. Is there any overlap in technologies that JSONR supports to what was previously supported? Yes, um, the overlap, as I mentioned just now, is around the log collection. In, in the past, so far, you know, the gateways, the Imperva gateway also supported collect, log collection of native audit from cloud databases or, and for some of the on-prem databases as well, okay? Um, and this overlaps with the, the log collection of the Sonar Gateway, okay? So we believe that the Sonar Gateway um, log collection is uh, a better choice, okay? And in the future, we will invest more and more uh, resources and, and efforts um, in the Sonar Gateway for uh, cloud databases and, uh, and all of those on-prem long-tail databases like... Uh, um, there is a long list of on-prem databases that aren't supported, okay? Like Progress, for example, or CouchDB, okay? Some on-prem databases or Vertica that I, I heard on Neo4j, mm -hmm. on-prem databases that aren't supported today by 
דם, we are, are already supported by Imperva, uh, JSONR, and if not, as I mentioned, um, we will be able to provide the support in a few weeks. Great. Uh, is the SOM going away? Will current multiple MXs be replaced by one? That's the plan, okay? Um, regardless how many MXs you have, we will provide scripts and services that will move all of your configuration from all of those MXs to a large scale MX. There will be actually two for active passive mode, okay, for redundancy, but eventually um, you, won't need, you won't need many MXs, more than one to manage all of your configurations. You'll need one to run all of those scans that you have, and you'll need another one for managing the agents and the gateways. Cool, thank you. There's a question. Can I, I add was... to that? Ahead, yep. It, it's Bob. Um, sometimes MXs are placed in specific regions due to GDPR or uh, specific country requirements. Um, so we're able to put MXs in those countries. The SOM mm -hmm. manages those just by pushing the same policies to all the MXs. That makes sense. That makes sense. So if you need to have a siloed uh, MXs due to siloed businesses, you know, uh, geographical reasons, definitely you will still be able to use uh, multiple MXs with a SOM on top. But uh, if there aren't such uh, needs, then th there is no any reason why you need uh, more than one MX. Thank okay. you. Um, the other question, and I think this was answered. So is the SOM a physical appliance? And then Bob said, no, it's a VM to manage multiple MXs, right? Just want to make sure I got that right. Yeah, that's right. Okay, good. All right, thank you. Um, and then Jana asks, will CDS continue to be supported or will that be replaced by JSONR? CDS will continue to be supported, definitely. Um, uh, CDS is um, direction uh, will be more towards um, like born in the cloud businesses, SaaS. So any each one of those uh, companies that need um, a SaaS solution, uh, the, the the solution, the preferred solution should be CDS. Okay. Yeah, and CDS is cloud data security, just in case no one yeah. or not everyone knew. Um, the other question. So these two questions are funny because. They were asked on, I think it was the last, or one of our JSONR um, things, but will DRA still be required for analytics or we, will JSONR do the analytics? No, DRA is the um, product for um, analytics and uh, DRA scope will grow even more because now DRA can uh, collect more native audit from any kind of uh, data source. Okay, including all the cloud databases and the long tail databases, we are going to extend dramatically the coverage of data risk analytics. Great. Uh, what native reporting will DAM have without JSONR? So currently there, there are reporting capabilities in the MX, okay, audit, um, forensic, and, uh, and other reporting on the on the um, assessments and so on. But uh, keep in mind that gradually, um, JSONR will become the preferred reporting solution and all the investment that, uh, most of the investment will be shifted to JSONR to improve its reporting and integrate them to, uh, to Imperva products. Okay, and, and around playbooks, um... He said it was very interesting. Uh, Eric said this. Uh, there's, is there a simulated date for playbooks? Is there, I guess, a stimated date for playbooks? I don't know, Eric. I, I'm not really following the question. So if you want to, if you're still here, you might want to just take yourself off mute and ask. Give you a few seconds. If not, um, So Richard asks, will the playbooks be similar to uh, Jupyter Notebooks? J 
J-U-P-Y-T-E-R. Um, so just to take it offline? Okay. Maybe. Uh, could be an opportunity for another uh, um, webinar session on, on, on Sonar uh, playbooks. Okay. Yeah, it's probably a good point. Um, yeah. Maybe we can answer some of those questions through another webinar. The next webinar we'll probably do is more January, February. Uh, what about uh, Popaya for South Africa, P-O-P-I-A? You were showing that little uh, graph of uh, that little place that we're protecting. I can't remember the slide, but Shamal, I don't know if, if you want to. So Popaya Poppy is similar to GDPR. It's compliance. It's now compulsory in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so far, I need to admit, I, I, I reviewed only the laws of the GDPR and CCPA, more GDPR. I haven't looked at uh, the other uh, regulations, um, but uh, we will get there. We'll get uh, to each one of them. I assume uh, there, there is like overlapping between uh, all of them, you know, but um, this is something that we'll have to get into and uh, understand how it works, what kind of, you know, requests, you know, the, the, the ability to search for PIIs, correlate PIIs to a data subject is, is probably a common, you know, need for, in order to adhere to all of those regulations. But there may be some changes, you know, by laws, like the SLA, the times to take you to provide an answer for a data subject or, or uh, handling the request and, and the, the nuances of the law could be different. Okay, so we, we need to review this. Um, Great. Yes. Uh, Toby, thanks so much. And everyone, thanks so much for staying a little bit after. It looks like that's all of the questions. It looks like there could also be some follow-up webinars in, in the future, maybe Q1 of next year. So certainly excited to ping Toby about those. Um, but... Uh, Keep the questions coming, uh, post those in the community. And I'm always here making sure that those questions are answered uh, as much as I can. Uh, and, and we'll have experts and hopefully others like yourself answering, answering those kind of questions. So hopefully this was helpful. Uh, you know, this is, and I know this is something that you guys have been wanting for a while. And so here it is, lots of uh, really good content that Kobe shared. So Kobe, thanks so much Thank for you. your time. Uh, Everyone else, thank you again for coming. And don't forget to come and sign up for the next webinar, which is two weeks from now. Um, and it will include some of the hardest hitters of all of uh, Imperva. So you get our CTO and our uh, uh, leader that runs data security uh, in, in both Ron and in um, uh, Kanal. So thank you, everyone. Go sign up today for the next webinar. Kobe. Thank you so much. Super awesome. This will be recorded and posted on the community soon. Uh, so all you have to do is go to community.imperva.com and do search hashtag webinar and you'll see that webinar there in the next few days. So thank you. Thanks.